Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1. This will be the third week we're looking at this thought that God speaks to his people. And um, we're going to look at this aspect in specific this morning of how God speaks through his Holy Spirit. And um, for those of you uh, who have grown up in church, you know a lot about of God and whatnot. Some of these things will be review, but I hope that maybe uh, an aspect or two uh, will be a help to us. Ultimately, as a believer, the most important part of our Christian walk after we're saved is that we hear God's voice, we understand how he speaks to us, and then we decide to obey, right? And that seems like a, a simple concept, and it is uh, but if that truly is the most important part of our Christian walk, then can we review over it enough? Uh, can we um, talk about it enough to be sure that we are uh, always, uh, first of all, willing to listen to God's voice, hearing him in all the different ways that he speaks to us, and then brushing up and making sure that I'm fully submitted, willing to be obedient when uh, he speaks to me. So uh, we saw in Genesis as we were Looking through Genesis chapter 15 in specific, uh, this, this phrase, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And we won't review over uh, the last two weeks, but I would encourage you um, to take advantage of, of listening to these messages uh, on speaking to God. They've been a great help to me. I think they've been a great help to you as well. And uh, it'll just give even more context to the message this morning. So we're going to pick up right here and look at this fact that God speaks through his Holy Spirit. The one, I guess the one aspect that I will review very quickly is, is this thought is, as we put in our minds, we know that God spoke to the, the great men of old, right? We, we, we put these uh, fathers of the faith, so to speak, in our, on a pedestal in our mind, right? Abraham, Moses, Joseph, King David, Solomon. We know that God spoke to them very clearly and plainly, but then for whatever reason, we just think that God doesn't speak to us like he did to them, or maybe not as often, or maybe not as clearly, and we've been understanding over the last few weeks that, no, in fact, God said, I change not. So if God doesn't change, one of the ways that he hasn't changed is the fact that he does speak to us, he speaks to his people, and that uh, he speaks very clearly. So the Holy Spirit, um, be turning in your Bible now, if you would, to Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. The Holy Spirit is part of what we call uh, the Trinity. The Holy Spirit uh, is God, God in three persons. The word Trinity and, and the phrase triune God, those, those words and phrases are not found in the Bible, in Scripture. It's something that we have used to just make the fact that God is uh, seen and uh, revealed to us in three different ways. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we make it very simply and just say the Trinity, and we understand that. There's nothing more added to the Trinity than God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Some religions will try to say that Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, is part of the Holy Trinity, or uh, maybe some saint, Saint Peter. Or, and Mary was a, a wonderful woman, blessed among women, right? Uh, you know, what an honor and a privilege to, to birth Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Uh, Peter and John, the, the disciple that Jesus loved, amazing men, but they are not holy men. They weren't perfect, right? They were, they're not part of the Trinity. So we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, nothing more, nothing less. We see the Trinity in action many places throughout the Word of God. We'll look at one this morning. We're in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. And Jesus, so here is Jesus, God the Son, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God. So there's the Holy Spirit. We have Jesus in the water. We have the Holy Spirit descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son. Well, who would the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son be? God. So we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all in action at the same time in Scripture. We could look at more places and see that. Um, so when we're saved, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of us. When you turned, when you repented from whatever it was that was keeping you from Jesus Christ, your sin, or maybe you were trusting in something else 
to get you to heaven. Maybe you were trusting in a baptism or you were trusting in being a good person or giving money to church or church attendance or whatever it was that was keeping you from Jesus Christ and trusting in him alone for salvation. What does the Bible say? For by grace are ye saved through faith. Now, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It is nothing, nothing we can do for salvation except believing in Jesus Christ. So when you repented and you turned from whatever it was that was keeping you from believing in Jesus and you turned and trusted in him and him alone for salvation, at that moment, the Holy Spirit of God came and dwelt inside of you. Every believer has the Holy Spirit inside of them. You say, I don't believe that. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. I don't expect you to take my word for anything. I wouldn't either. Uh, but we can take God's word for it. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Paul here is writing a letter to the church at Corinth. And he said, what? That's a great motherly question, right? <laughs> what? <laughs> and then whatever else proceeds after that. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? A temple is simply a dwelling place. The temple is where the Holy Ghost of God dwells in me. That is, the, my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. So we understand these two things about the Holy Spirit. First of all, we just talked about it. The Holy Spirit is God, and that's just presented as a fact. Then we understand that when we are saved, the Holy Spirit, God, comes to live inside of the believer. So now that we understand those two things, let's understand a few more things about the Holy Spirit, more specifically geared towards God speaking to us through the Holy Spirit. So let's turn to John chapter 16 and verse 13. First of all, we understand this. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. John 16, verse 13. How be it when he, this is Jesus talking, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. That is why it is so important that we, as spiritual leaders, as parents, as leaders in ministry, as a pastor or a youth leader, no matter what position you have in leadership, ultimately, that position of leadership ought to be pointing people not to yourself, not to a great man or a great lady, ought to be pointing ultimately everyone to God. Because God, the Holy Spirit, is the spirit of truth. He will teach and reveal and lead me and lead you and lead your children and those that work under you. He will lead them to truth. There really became a shift. Um, it was, a, it was a, a minor shift, but, but ultimately I think one that it really... It, caused a lot of people to have an unbiblical mindset. There was a shift of, of preaching where we preached more about, about or against sin than we did simply presenting truth. And that's because there was generations of, of people who were saved out of sin, and they know what sin, uh, when it's finished, look like, looks like. And, and I'm not trying to say that sin is, is no good. Sin, or sin is, is fine. Sin is, is bad, and we ought to not sin. But what happened is, and I have to be careful of this in my own life, we preach more against sin than we simply do presenting truth. And what, we've, what has happened is we have created many churches who know the truth, but we don't present truth. We, we talk about what we can't do. And we have a lot of people, we know what not to do, but we don't know necessarily what to do because we focus so much on, well, don't do these things, than we do just seek God, pray, read his word, follow his Holy Spirit's leading, and he will guide you to truth. So there really needs to be a shift. And I am, again, this is, this is preaching to myself. This is, uh, Pastor Adrian Rogers said, when you're looking for the devil in the church, don't ever fail to look in the pulpit. 
And uh, so I want to make sure that as I preach that it is truth and that I spend more time presenting him, pointing you to him than I do telling you what not to do because he'll teach you that through his Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth. Number two, spiritual truths can be revealed only by God. Spiritual truths can be revealed only by God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, let's, let's turn there. This is a great passage. And sometimes we read one verse and we focus on that and we forget the, the next verse that gives much more understanding and context. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 9. This verse is very commonly quoted. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, Neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And we read that and we say, wow, that's awesome. God has so many things to give me, and I don't know what they are. His ways aren't my ways. We just have to trust and follow him. And he has, I know the thoughts, Jeremiah said, that I think towards you, thoughts of peace. And God has my best interest in good, my best interest in mind, Romans 8, 28. For all we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, to whom they have predestinated. So we have all of these things, but we read that verse and we say, wow, there's so much that God has and God knows and is going to do. And I don't know what it's going to be, but that's great. We can just trust him. Verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So what happens is we think, well, I'm in the dark. I don't know what God's going to do in my life. I don't know what God is saying. I don't know where he's working. No, 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 no. We can know if we're a believer because the Spirit reveals the truths of God to us. So when we say, well, I don't know where God's working, through his Holy Spirit teaching us and revealing to us, as he speaks to us, as the Holy Spirit guides us, our eyes can be opened and God says, I'm working on this person. Be a testimony here. Be a help here. How do we know that? Well, Jesus, he was a man, right? He was all God, but also he was all man. And I'm learning as I grow in my Christian walk that it's not very hard for me to, to believe that Jesus Christ was all God. It's very difficult for me to wrap my mind around the fact that he was all man as well and that he was subject to some of the limitations that we are, but yet he was all God so he could do anything. How does that work? I have no idea. Uh, I'm not God, so I don't understand it. So Jesus, of course, our great example, right? He's here on earth. He is a man. But yet he does, has an incredible ministry. For three, three and a half years, he heals and he preaches and he teaches. He preaches perfect messages, gives the most perfect example to help people understand. He heals and he casts out devils. Everything that Jesus did, if you were to look in John, and we won't take time to go there, but it says in John, I can do nothing but what the Father does. And so what, what Jesus was doing is he was showing us how to live the Christian life. Jesus was the greatest Christian that ever walked the face of the earth. And what he did is he was totally submitted to the Father. He watched for what the Father was doing. He listened for what the Father told him to do. And what did he say? I, I do, I, I'm, I, uh, every, um, man cannot live by bread, by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Why was Jesus always trying to go away and go apart to pray? Because he was focused on a relationship with God. And at every time that he was going to go away and have that relationship with God and pray and seek God, what happened? Somebody would interrupt him, right? A divine appointment. Somebody would stop him. Master, would you heal me? Master, would you teach us? As Jesus was seeking God, God brought people and said, here's my will. This is where I'm working. Be a part of that. And that's what we do in our life as the Holy Spirit guides us through our lives. And we're submitted to him and we're listening to where he is speaking. Someone will come up to you and they'll say, are you a Christian? Why would anybody ask you that question? Well, that was random. That was weird. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Get back in your truck. That was God through your Holy Spirit revealing to you where he's working. 
Say, hey, I'm having a tough time right now. Do you think that you could help me? That's where God's working. God brought that person to you because he knows that you have something that can help that person. That's where God's working. So then, as God guides you through his Holy Spirit to where he's working, then you say, God, how do you want me to be involved with this person? Would you give me the words to say to help this and such person? Do you see how that works? So God reveals spiritual truths through his Holy Spirit. He's the only one that can do that. When I understand a spiritual truth, it's because God is working in my life. When you walk away and you walk out of the doors this morning, or maybe a Sunday previous, you say, boy, that was a great message. Pastor preached this, and I was just really able to understand fill in the blank. That wasn't because I preached such a great message. Because the Holy Spirit taught you. Because God taught you that truth. What is our heart? What is our flesh? We, in Adam, all died. So our natural person, our natural flesh, is sinful, right? The Bible says the heart is wicked and deceitful, desperately wicked. So our human flesh is not the one that understands spiritual truth, right? So there's only three possibilities of, of somebody who could reveal a truth to us, either ourselves, and we know that we can't understand spiritual truths in our unspiritual state, even though when we're saved, we're a new person, we still are attached to this sinful flesh. So then maybe Satan could be the one who teaches us spiritual truth. Do you think Satan's going to help us understand things about God and, and about the Bible? No, he wants to do the exact opposite. He wants to keep us in the dark. But if our gospel be hid, it's, him to, it's hid to them that are lost. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. So Satan, he's putting the blinders on us, trying to help us not understand spiritual truths. So it's not us. It's not Satan. So who would be the only one that could teach us spiritual things? God. So when you understand a spiritual truth, that is God working in your life. Number three, the Holy Spirit, he is our teacher. John chapter 14, verse 26. John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, capital C, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, catch this, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. We find that uh, very similar phrasing in Matthew chapter 28 in the last three verses of Matthew, what many of us consider the Great Commission, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. In Jeremiah chapter 31, I'll read this for you. Um, Jeremiah chapter 31. We have a promise of a new testament, a new covenant. And here's what the Bible says. Behold, the day shall come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. What was that new covenant, that new testament? It was Jesus Christ. That's why the second half of our Bible is called the New Testament. That's why when Jesus was at uh, the, the uh, uh, Passover, the uh, Lord's Supper with his disciples, what did he say? This cup is the New Testament in my blood. What was that New Testament? What was that new covenant? He goes on to say in, in verse 33 that it wasn't going to be the old covenant, the law, uh, the Ten Commandments, and the book of Leviticus, and, and Deuteronomy, and Numbers, and just like, I don't know how they could remember all of these things that they had to do. It was going to be very simple. Verse 33, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. What is that? That's the Holy Spirit. When we're saved, God puts everything that we need to know. I don't know how I could remember everything that's in the Word of God. Well, you can't in your own fleshly mind, but you can when God puts his law in your inward parts and write in, on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 34, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. Here's the key, for they shall all know me. So there it is. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. Now, spiritual leaders, pastors, godly parents, those are a great advantage to help us guide us to truth 
and help us maybe more quickly or more readily understand things about the Word of God you read and you think, boy, I, I don't really understand that. Lord, would you reveal the truth to me? And, and you're still struggling. You can go to a commentary. You can go to a pastor who's been studying the words for, for many years and, you can, and he can say, well, this is what the Holy Spirit showed me. But ultimately, who is our teacher? It's not a pastor. It's not a commentary. It's not our parents. Because what are all of those things? Commentaries and pastors and parents, they're all human. Humans can lead us astray. But the spirit of truth, God, he'll never lead us to something false. He'll never lead us astray. He will always lead us to truth. Here's the last thing that we're going to look at about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit reveals spiritual truths to us. He's the only one that can do that. He is the teacher. And lastly, the Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus. Brother Kurt mentioned this just a little bit in his Sunday school lesson. The Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus. John chapter 15, verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father... Even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. The Holy Spirit, when it has free course, and when we are totally surrendered to the Holy Spirit, what does it do ultimately? It testifies of Jesus. Why is it so important to be filled with the Holy Spirit and guided by the Holy Spirit and submitted completely to the Holy Spirit? What does the Bible say in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come unto you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. What is the first thing that happens after you are completely Holy Spirit filled? You can't help it but to be a great witness for Jesus Christ. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going out and actively being a witness confrontational soul winning. Sometimes it just means that your life is so vastly different from anything that everyone else has ever seen that they think there is something, someone, ultimately, that's different about that person. I've had it several times since I've been a pastor. We go and, and may, visiting someone who maybe visited church or someone that you're trying to come to church and, and you go and uh, knock on their door, visit it with them for a few moments, and then hear a testimony later when they say, I don't know what it was, but when you showed up on my door, it just felt like a presence. It just felt like God was there. Well, that certainly wasn't because I was there. The, the feeling of God that they were getting was not from Drew Rogers. It was because the Holy Ghost was there. The Spirit of God was drawing them to himself. When you're filled with the Holy Ghost, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, your life will be a powerful irrefutable testimony that testifies of Jesus Christ. Where are we going to go now? So here's, here's, here's the thought. Here's the key. The Holy Spirit indwells the believer. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit reveals truth. He's the only one that can do it. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. He's the one who testifies of Jesus Christ. So an encounter with the Holy Spirit is an encounter with God. An encounter with the Holy Spirit is an encounter with God. When you feel the Holy Spirit teaching you or guiding you, giving you the words to say, bringing to remembrance the things that he's taught you, all of those things, when the Holy Spirit does that inside of you, if the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity, if the Holy Spirit is God, then that means that that's God working in your life, actively and just as real as he spoke to Moses, just as real as he spoke to Abram and the prophets of old. So now we're going to look at this fact, my response, because now we understand that it's not my response to the Holy Spirit. Somehow that almost seems to make it like a little less, right? Oh, I disobey the Holy Spirit. I would never disobey God. Well, if we disobey the Holy Spirit, we're disobeying God. When we obey and listen to the Holy Spirit, we are obeying and listening to God. So here's my response. When God spoke to Moses, what Moses did next was critical. When God spoke to the disciples, when Jesus spoke to the disciples, what they did next was critical. 
What you do immediately after the Holy Spirit of God speaks to you is critical. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 3 and 4 is the record of the burning bush experience. God speaking to Moses at the burning bush. Where we pick up this account in Exodus chapter 4, verse 14, it's been almost a chapter and a half of Moses wrestling, arguing, delaying, debating, and reasoning with God of how he can't do what God has clearly asked him to do. Moses knew it was God. He knew what God was telling him to do, but he was giving him excuses as to why he didn't think that he could do what God was asking him to do. So he gives, I believe, the fourth excuse. Well, I'm slow of speech. And at this point, God is, is getting tired of Moses arguing with him. All right? So let's, this is where we pick up in, in Exodus 4.14. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. So God's like, Moses, I've told you that I'm going to empower you. I've told you all the things that I want you to do. I've told you that I will be the one that does it. Moses is still giving excuses. So he says, Why don't you ask your brother Aaron? He can speak well. And notice what happens now. And ultimately, this is what we're going to learn. That delayed obedience is disobedience. And God put a couple of restrictions on Moses and Aaron going forward for the next 40 years in the wilderness that was going to make them not as efficient or effective as they could have been because Moses delayed, even though he ultimately obeyed. Notice this in verse 15. Thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth, meaning Moses was going to put words in in Aaron's mouth, and Aaron was going to be Moses' spokesperson. Spokesperson, And I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what ye shall do. So catch this before we finish this thought. God wasn't going to abandon Moses. He didn't say, well, forget you, Moses. I'll get someone else. I'm never coming. I'm never going to work in your life again. Moses was having a self-centered response to a God-centered experience. He was acting in flesh and faithlessness, but God didn't abandon him. Aren't you glad that God doesn't abandon you? I'm glad that God doesn't abandon me when I act in fear rather than in faith, when I am self-centered, when I ought to be God-centered. I'm thankful that God doesn't. But the delay caused him to be a little less effective. We see that in verse 16. And he, talking about Aaron, shall be thy spokesman unto the people. Notice this next part. And he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. You see that? Mm -hmm. Moses was going to act instead of God to Aaron. God was going to speak to Moses. Moses was going to have to relay the message to Aaron. Aaron was going to relay the message to the people, and we see that often. That was a little bit of a of a twist, a little bit of a, a hindrance that happened because Moses didn't say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't think I can do it. I don't understand it. But I have faith that if you can talk to me through a burning bush, that you'll do everything else that you're saying you're going to do. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, we find them in Mark chapter 1. We're going to bring all this into a conclusion. They were invited by Jesus to abandon their careers and follow him. Moses, he delayed, he wrestled, he argued, ultimately obeyed. The disciples, though they had very likely never met Jesus before, certainly hadn't understood who he was. Jesus called them very simply, gave them very little instruction, but yet they abandoned their careers to follow him immediately. Mark chapter 1, verse 16. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. They had no context. They had no idea how it was going to work out. They didn't know how long they were going to be following him. They had no idea where he was going. Jesus just said, follow me. 
the spirit inside of them was drawn, or the spirit on them was drawing them. And they said, let's go. And when he had gone a little further, verse 19, thence he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants. It'd be like if I was on a roof with dad, and it was just me and him, him and, and another guy, maybe a, a scrub on the ground picking up shingles. And we're working together, and then someone walked by the side of the road. Sorry if you're the scrub that works with dad that picks up shingles. Um, you're working, you're, uh, a guy walked by and he said, hey, hey, Drew, follow me. Hey, Dad, i got to follow this guy. Just left him with the hired servants. Hey, hope you get the roof done. I see storm clouds are coming. That's what, that's what these guys did. He left, they left Dad high and dry uh, in the ship with the hired servants. But ultimately, they decided, and maybe they didn't even totally understand the full scope of what they were doing at the time, but ultimately, they decided to follow God over a career, over their family, over money. That puts it right down on the bottom shelf to us today, doesn't it? Make up your mind right now that when the Spirit of God speaks to you, you'll do whatever He says. Make up your mind right now that when the Spirit of God speaks to you, that you'll do whatever He says. Because I promise you, right now, before he's prompting or asking you to do something, that will be the easiest time to obey and just predetermine whatever God says. You say, well, I'll just determine when the time comes that I obey, all right? So he'll ask you to give up some of your time. We're having a work day at church. We're doing a flyer blitz and for, for vacation Bible school. We're having vacation Bible school, junior camp, any number of things where there's an opportunity for God to be working. And the Holy Spirit will say, you need to sign up for that. You need to give some of your time to God. And you'll say, oh, this is, let me pull out my calendar really quick. Oh, this is a busy week. I don't know if I can swing it this week. I don't think I can do that. Because when we haven't predetermined that we're going to obey God, we can always find a reason not to. Let's do the same thing with our, our, our treasure. God will ask you to, to, to give of your time, treasure, and talent. So your treasure, who hold on to that wallet, right? Just predetermine that when God says, give this, you'll give it. You'll say, well, I'll decide when the time comes. Well, when the time comes, it might be a week where the bank account doesn't have as much cushion as it usually does, or it has no cushion. And then you'll say, well, I know the Holy Spirit is prompting me to, to give that, but I, I don't think I can. God wasn't asking you if you could. He wasn't asking you if you wanted to. What about your talent? Right? You say, well, I have all of this creative ability. I have this singing ability. I have this artistic ability. I have this leadership ability. But I want to use that for myself. I want to use that in a career. I want to use that in a fill-in-the-blank, whatever way to bring glory to myself, to bring more treasure to myself. And God says, I want you to give that all to me. If we just predetermine ahead of time that when he asks us, whatever it is, whatever the cost, that we'll give it. Jesus prepared us for that. He said, if any man hate not his father or mother and brother or sister or father and his, his own life also, and take up his cross, he cannot be my disciple. So we have to predetermine that Jesus comes first, number one, no matter what he asks. And right now, if you decide that, that'll be the easiest decision that you ever make. Because it's always going to be difficult after that. You say, you know what, I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know where I'm going to get the time. I don't know where I'm going to get the money. I, I really wanted to do this, but I already determined that my, what, my, what is mine is his, because ultimately it is his anyway, right? So... I'm just going to give it to him. <coughs> oh, we don't have. Let, let's look at this really quickly. Ethan, or Brother Mark, will you throw that slide up? In a practical way, I want to see this. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 7. This is a pattern that we see in Moses' life over and over and over. I'm just going to give one example. I had many passages of Scripture that show this. But this is often how God works in our life, too. 
God invites Moses to join him in delivering Israel. That underlined part, delivering Israel, was specific to Moses. For your life, it's God invites you to join him. You fill in the blank for yourself. Then God tells you exactly what he wants you to do. Moses then obeyed. All right? Then, afterwards, God accomplished what he purposed to do. God give, is going to give you a task, but ultimately, God is the one who's going to be doing the work. He just wants you to obey. And what is the end result of it all? You get praise and glory for how amazing you are? No. Moses and those around him came to know God more powerfully and more intimately. When God works in your life, when God does something in you and through you that only can be explained by him working in your life, who's going to get the glory? God is, which is ultimately why he put us on this earth. When God does something that only he can do, your faith and trust in him is going to, to grow. Those that see you and they think, man, how is Pastor Drew doing that? I know him. I've known him since he was a kid. There's no way he's doing this. You are correct. Is God working in and through me? And it will be God working in and through you and others will see that and they'll say, wow. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So let's see this practically work and we'll be done. Exodus chapter, let me get to my notes. When I abandon the notes, that's where things go awry. Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. The Lord said unto Moses, so here's God inviting Moses to join him. See, I have made thee a God unto Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee. So here's God inv inviting Moses to join him. Then we have God telling Moses exactly what he wants Moses to do. All that I command thee, Aaron thy brother, shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he may send the children of Israel out of his hand. Now here's God revealing to Moses and ultimately is going to be accomplishing what God was going to do. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Pharaoh, but Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth my uh, armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by my great judgments." So he invites Moses to join. He tells Moses what he's supposed to do. He reveals to Moses what he, God, is going to do. So then Moses now has to decide if he's going to obey or not, right? And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. So there's their glorifying part. Everyone around him, the Egyptians, Israel, Moses, Aaron, everybody is gonna know that God is most powerful and they're going to understand him more intimately. Verse 6, And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them, so did they. We see that you, you read through the, the story of Moses and the children of Israel and look for that pattern. You'll see it over and over and over and over again. Now it's not in a pattern. Don't put your faith and trust in a method. But often what God does is he speaks to us and he invites us to join in what he's doing. He tells you exactly what part you're going to have. He tells you what he's going to do. When he does those things, you and your family and the church and the world are going to see God working so plainly and so clearly they're going to glorify him. But here's the piece that we often miss. Boom. We say, I don't want to do that. I don't think I can. I don't know how God could do that. I don't think it's going to work. And we miss out on a lot. And ultimately, our Delayed obedience puts a hindrance on our Christian walk, and our delayed obedience may cost others something we don't even know, right? When we delay and don't do what God asks us to do, we don't know who's missing out. It might not be just our family and church family. It might be the lost. It might be something or someone that we never understand and know because we chose to delay. So my challenge to you is this. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. If you're a believer, he works and he speaks all the time. First of all, listen. Recognize that it's God speaking. And predetermine that you're going to obey what he tells you to do. When you obey, there's such a blessing. When you delay or disobey, it doesn't necessarily mean that God is going to punish you, but it may just be that there's blessings that we miss. 
I thought about a story that I read and, and I, I sent it, I forwarded it to dad and how that decisions that we make today affect people so far down the road. Had dad been disobedient to the Holy Spirit and to God leading him here to Roger City, two of his three sons wouldn't have the, likely wouldn't have the wives that they have today. I wouldn't have, we wouldn't have grown up in the, the church and, the, and, and be in this setting like we are. I may not be the pastor here today. Had God not, had dad not obeyed, it doesn't necessarily mean that there would have been punishment for that, but there would have been a lot of, a lot of missed blessings, right? So it's so important that we predetermine that we'll obey the Holy Spirit when he works in our life, because when God works in us through the Holy Spirit, it is God working in us.